This will be a short course on what we call the Stream Test Test Framework. Uh, this is my attempt to get STFU into a talk, and now I just did. So there we go. Um, so a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to go over some of the motivation for why we built a test framework, because everybody has testing, so why did we think ours is so special that we gave it a name? Um, so I'm going to talk about the motivation, then I'm going to go over some of the basics of the Stream Test Test Framework. I'll give an overview of what the project actually is. I'll talk about PyTest, which is one of the core components of the test framework, which is it's an open source um, Python library that enables test things. Um, I'm going to show a quick example of some of the commands that the Stream Test Test Framework project makes available to users. And then I'm actually going to walk through one of our tests. So Oleg mentioned you know, connecting to JDBC databases with the multi-table consumer. I'm actually going to show a test that we use and we run every single night probably 40 times um, that tests that specific stage against about five or six different relational databases, all with one written test. Um, so I'll show how that works. And then at the end, I'll give a teaser of some of the next things um, that StreamSess is going to talk about in testing, not in this talk, because that'd be way more than 45 minutes worth. Um, we have, we're going to have a series of blog posts coming out that will at least um, lift the veil of secrecy of how we make sure that our products actually work. So, um, so motivation. So. How, how many of you guys have actually looked at the stream sets data collector source code at one time or another for any reason? Okay, so at least a handful of people. Um, so stream sets data collector, like most of our products, is predominantly written in Java. So there's a front end that's not Java, most of it's Java. Um, and the motivation for creating a new test framework actually came from our experiences with the testing that had to do with the existing code. Um, so anyone that's been a Java developer knows that um, unit tests can live really well next to their code. You know, you write unit tests mainly as a tool for developers to make sure that as they're adding code, they don't break existing things, that the functionality works, that off by one errors aren't there. Um, but it's really verbose, right? So if you want to have a, a test of something that talks to a database, you might write 40 lines of Java code to actually say, this is the table I want. This is what the rows should look like. This is what the schema should look like. It's not really the most readable thing. And if you're talking about tests that are written rapidly, it's, it gets kind of frustrating. Um, as part of that, it also needs to be compiled, which means that if you are doing kind of exploratory test writing, you kind of have to make a change and then compile your code and then run it. And if something goes wrong, and you know how with Java, the packaging situation can cause its own problems, um, that could be kind of a problem. Um, and then the last one, and this is something that was actually, um, anyone who's looked at our source code knows that for a long time, we actually had sort of integration tests that lived with our unit tests. We call them mini ITs. Um, one of the biggest motivations of creating a new test framework for us for, for kind of end-to-end -end testing was these mini ITs because what they would do is they would actually, as part of the test, spin up miniature versions of the systems we were trying to connect to. So they would spin up like a mini Hadoop cluster, right? Um, and anyone who comes from the Hadoop world, um, like I used to work on the Hadoop project and the HBase project, any of these Java projects that spin up mini versions uh, tend to not be very reliable. They tend to be really flaky as much as we try for them not to be. So we saw a lot of that flakiness internally and decided, OK, is there something we could do to alleviate these problems for, for a different type of testing? So not unit testing, but really that end-to-end -end user testing of, of pipelines. And that's where we came up with the Stream Test Test Framework. So what it is, um, it's a Python 3 project. So um, possibly now, but definitely later this week, you'd be able to run pip3 install stream test, dash test framework on your laptop, and you would get the test framework installed on your machine. Um, so it's just going to be up on PyPI. And the project is basically composed of three different parts, um, which are all very interconnected. The first part is libraries. Um, so basically, this means that these are libraries available as part of the test frameworks so that you could then use them within a test. Uh, the most important one here is one that we've already released before, which is called the Stream Test SDK for Python. So there's a blog post that went out about this. Um, about three or four months ago that basically talks about how we've launched this SDK with a lot more functionality. And I'll show examples of what this is, but this is actually, this is already code that customers of stream sets can use to build pipelines programmatically. So if you don't want to have to go into a UI and select things and drag and drop them and go into the you know, configuration UI, there's actually a really nice syntax to say, hey, add this stage and set these configurations within that stage and then add this other stage and then connect them in, in any which way. Um, so that's the stream SDK for Python. It is not an open source um, component, but any customer that has one of our enterprise or premium subscriptions, I believe, 
um, can automatically get an activation key for this product. So um, customers that are heavy users of stream sets, you already have this available to you. The second kind of libraries that are part of this um, project are for environments. And I'll show exactly what I mean by that, but basically, um, if you're trying to do end-to-end -end testing of something, you don't want to just rely on the thing you're testing to tell you if it's working, right? Um, you don't want to sort of create a pipeline and then if StreamSet says that it wrote to a destination, you don't want to just trust it. You kind of want to have some code that could go talk to your database and say, let me scan this table. Let me make sure the rows that StreamSet says are there. Let me make sure they're actually there. So the, the test framework has that. And then the last two parts of the project, which I'll give a little bit of detail about in the next couple slides, um, one is PyTest, and as I said, this is a, a Python project that's really predominant in the Python community. Um, it consists of a test runner, and it consists of a lot of really cool kind of test abstractions, so that if you're writing tests, you have a bunch of cool tools to use when writing a test, and I'll demonstrate one of them on the next slide. And then the last piece is Docker integration. So Chris mentioned, um, he's not here, but he mentioned um, the ability to start up Docker containers of SDC and how you have to sort of rebuild um, your Docker images if you want to add new stage libraries. Uh, you won't have to do that anymore because as part of test framework, you don't have to. So, um, so why is PyTest a big deal? So to show why I'm a big fan of PyTest, I'm actually going to show uh, an example of a really, really stupid, not even really test, but just kind of code that could be sort of used within a test just to show one of the cool constructs of PyTest. And specifically, I'm talking about something called a fixture. Okay, so. Um, so what a fixture is in PyTest is it's kind of a function that you can define that you could then use across different tests. And usually when people use fixtures, they make fixtures to represent um, some sort of external resource. So for example, as I'm going to show in a couple slides here, one of the fixtures we have in the stream says test framework represents a database. And what's kind of cool about fixtures is that you can share them across tests. So if I had 100 tests that were testing the JDBC you know, um, consumer of ours, I don't have to sort of instantiate a database each time for all 100 tests, the fixtures have a really simple way for me to basically say, hey, as soon as one test needs it, start it up, but then any other tests in this, you know, in the whole session or within this one Python file, just use the same database that I already started up. And so we actually do that for, for something like streams that's data collector, because we want to be able to say, start up a data collector of a particular version with the stage libraries I need, but then once I start it, I don't need every single test to get a clean one of those because that takes you know, 10 seconds to start up in Docker, so just reuse them. So this test kind of shows, this code here shows an example. Um, I have two tests, one's called test fixture one, one's called test fixture two, and they both have this argument called a fixture, which is defined down here. And so literally what, what's happening here is that as soon as PyTest is run against this file, it's gonna run all the things that start with test. And when it sees that it needs a fixture, it'll go and look for fixtures in this case called a fixture, it'll instantiate it. And then from then on, after it's instantiated the first time, it's not going to need to again. And so you see here that when it runs the first test that I had, um, it's going to go ahead and create that fixture. But then after that, it just reuses it later on. I'll, and this, this is a really toy, silly example that I ran. But like it's actually, I'll show in a couple, in a couple slides here how this is used for something useful. Um, so that's PyTest. This is one of the pieces of the test framework. The other piece that's really important is the Docker integration. And so one part of how we use Docker, I already kind of gave away. Um, we heavily use Docker when testing data collector because we have the ability to spin up streams as data collector instances, have certain stage libraries preloaded. Um, they don't have to be pre-built into the container. We have ways of actually sort of merging in the different stage libraries we need for a given container. Um, but the second way we use Docker containers is actually when running our test framework. And the reason we do this is because um, one of the things that we really heavily invested in, in the last couple of years of stream sets is automation. We want to be able to run these tests really easily on Jenkins nodes every night. And if we had a project where you sort of had to have 100 Python libraries pre-installed on your machine, you'd find that that would be kind of a, a bottleneck of development. So actually, our stream sets test framework itself is a Docker image. And when we want to run tests, what we do is, as shown in kind of this example here, you basically can, can clone down our data collector test repo. And this repo, by the way, we're going to open source this week. So anyone who's curious about what kind of testing do we actually run against data collector, you'll be able to see all those lines of code. Um, what you basically can do is you can make that directory your, your working directory. And then you can use a command called STF test. And when you do that, it's actually going to launch a Docker container of the test framework. And that Docker container has PyTest pre-installed. It has our stream test SDK that I mentioned. It has these extra kind of environment libraries. 
Um, but also, it's actually going to basically volume mount the tests that are living on your host machine into that container as well. Okay, and then it's going to run the tests from inside that container, which means that as you iterate, as you add more libraries, you don't have to at all change your build slaves on Jenkins to work because this container is kind of a self-contained thing. What's also nice about it then is that once you're done, there's no cleanup. You can sort of just delete that container, remove that container that's running, and you're, you're back to where you started. Okay, so I'll show an example of what this looks like. Um, but this right here is the main test, the main command that STF provides, which is called STF test. And what it does is, again, it volume mounts the current directory you're in into the Docker container that has the test framework inside, and then it runs the tests against it. One of the issues we had early on before we kind of had this approach was we would find that developers would say, this test works on my machine, and we would go, well, no, it doesn't work in production when we run on Jenkins. If everything's always running a container, whether for a dev or in Jenkins, it's always going to work. It's, it's like the promise of the JVM, like, you know, write once, run anywhere. Um, it actually works for us in, in Docker in this case. So this is one command. So this is STF test. Um, STF also has three other commands that we're going to, um, that people will be able to use. One is one Pat actually alluded to, which is called STF shell. This is really, really useful. If you're a developer who wants to really rapidly iterate on a test, you'd actually be able to run this command and it drops you into an interactive terminal within that test framework container. So that if, you, you know, if you've never written a test before, but you kind of say, well, let me poke around in a Python interpreter and let me try some, some of these you know, constructs, let me try to do some stuff with it, and you don't want to pre-install all these you know, 100 libraries, STF shell will drop you into an environment where you can just do that, and then when you're done, just get out of it, and you know, no, no change has been done to your laptop. Um, another command is STF build. STF build is actually the command that we use internally for building Docker images of these various dependencies that we have. So not only building the test framework, but I mentioned um, you know, we build Docker images of streams as data collector itself. We also, build, um, we also build Docker images of every stage library that we might want to use because if I want to have a data collector instance with the JDBC and the AWS libraries and nothing else, we actually build the JDBC library into one image, the AWS one into another image, and then basically at runtime you can say, hey, just give me those two containers merged in with my data collector one, and when it starts up, those two libraries will already be present. So you don't have to do like a restart, you don't have to go through a package manager. Um, it's really seamless. And actually, STF start is what, what I was mentioning that Chris could find useful. Um, with STF start, you can say STF start SDC, and then pass in a list of which stage libraries you actually care about, and within about five or 10 seconds, you'll have a data collector running with all those stage libraries preloaded for you. So um, just, just some fun kind of kind of tooling. But let me actually show an example of, of kind of what one of these tests look like so you guys get a, get a sense of um, if this is something that could be useful for you guys. Um, this, as I said, we're open sourcing this repository data collector tests. This test specifically is called, it's, on, it's from a file called stage slash test JDBC stages. And the test is called test JDBC multiple or multi-table, I misspelled that, um, consumer origin simple. Okay, so, um, so specifically, this is going to be a really, this is like a smoke test pretty much of our multi-table JDBC consumer. Um, two quick notes. Uh, one is that we call this a stage test. And what I mean by that is we have sort of different classifications of tests. Some tests are designed to test a full kind of end-to-end -end pipeline workflow. So if we're testing things like uh, our, our Hive drift solution, right, to make sure that your data in your relational database, if there's schema drift, that it can actually be propagated into your, into your next destination. Um, that's more of a pipeline kind of end-to-end -end test. Stage tests are sort of designed to, to be an end-to-end -end test, but really to isolate individual stages. So in this case, what, the, what this multi-table stage test is going to look like will be basically the JDBC multi-table origin to trash. Okay? So, all, so the hope is that if this test were ever to fail, we would know that chances are it's that multi-table consumer that's at fault, not one of these other you know, 10 possible stages or something that you might build into a pipeline in production. Um, and the last note, and I'll show actually how this happens a little bit later, but I, I brought up this fixture concept for a reason, because almost all the tests that we have under this data collector test repo could both be run as normal tests or as upgrade tests, by which I mean you could basically, just by changing slightly the command line command you use when running the test, you can say, well, when I build this pipeline, what if I were to build a pipeline in data collector 2.7? but then run my pipelines in 3.4. And we know customers do this. They build pipelines in one version of SDC, they save them into a file somewhere, and then they reload them you know, months later into a brand new release, and then they say, hey, something's broken, the upgrade didn't go properly of my, of my exported pipeline. This is how we test to make sure that doesn't happen, because every night we actually can run 
um, sort of an arbitrarily large matrix of upgrade combinations across different data collector versions. So I'll show what that actually looks like. Um, so what this test looks like actually follows a, a paradigm that we use on a lot of our tests. It's, it's like a four-step process. So for this test in particular, there's step one, which is setup, where we basically load, we create a database and we load data into it, okay? Um, or specifically, we create a table in an existing database and we load data into it as part of the test. And we also start up one of these SDC containers. So I mentioned that we sort of want the ability to dynamically spin up data collectors so that they have the right stage libraries. Um, that's part of the setup phase. The second phase is execution. So that's where we actually programmatically build the pipeline. We start it. We actually also capture a snapshot of the data that flows through the pipeline. Okay, so that's how we sort of can see what's actually being loaded. Um, step three is assertion. We basically will do a comparison of the snapshot data we get to the data that we initially loaded in step one. And then the last part is teardown, where we remove the data that we put into the database so we don't have, we don't have this like infinitely large growing database because we run a lot of tests. Um, and that's also when we stop SDC instances, though we also have an option to keep them around if you want to debug something that's going wrong on your system. Okay, um, so let me actually show what these steps look like in code. All right, so in the setup phase, so I specifically talked about this whole fixture thing with PyTest for a reason. So in our tests, so our tests are all called test something. So in this case, test JDBC multi-table consumer origin simple. It's a mouthful. Um, the three fixtures that we use in this test are called SDC Builder, SDC Executor, and Database. The first two, SDC Builder and Executor, if you give the same version of SDC for both building and running the pipelines, it'll actually be a single data collector instance. The framework is smart enough to know, okay, he wants to build it in 3.4 and run it in 3.4, I'll just start up one data collector. But if you actually tell us on the command line, hey, run it from 3.0 to 3.5, snapshot or something like that, whatever release you want, it'll say, oh, okay, in that case, I'm only going to build the pipeline in one version of SDC, I'll export it, and then I'm actually going to run it in a later version, and I'll make sure that the, you know, the upgrade logic that we have built into SDC actually works as intended. All right, so we'll see how that works later. Um, the database piece I'll show in, I believe, the next slide will kind of have more details on this, um, but actually, actually this, this slide shows pretty much most of it. Um, so then here's the rest of the setup. So th this part here with the fixtures is where the data collector instances actually start. The test framework handles starting them up, giving them the necessary um, uh, stage libraries preloaded. Um, the rest of the setup has to do with loading the database. And this is one example of some of these environment libraries that are built into the StreamSets test framework. This library in particular is called SQL Alchemy. It's, uh, again, one of these open source libraries that's really popular in the Python community. What's really nice about this library is you guys, if you've dealt with SQL before, you know that some databases use backticks to differentiate table names. Some use double quotes, some require single quotes, right? SQL Alchemy is cool because it sort of provides a common interface and then under the covers, it'll decide what exact queries to send to your database. What this means is that this specific test, this actual, this is copy and pasted code from this test. This one test can run against the five or six relational databases that we actually test against every night as part of our data collector automated testing. So the initial concern we always had was, well, does this mean we need to run, write the test six times once for each relational database? With libraries like SQL Alchemy, we don't have to do that because this one test will run against anything we throw at it. Um, so basically, these lines of the code of the test are basically where I mentioned this is a smoke test. This is a really simple test. So in this case, we have a two column table that we're creating in, in, our, in our database. We create the table, and then we just add basically three rows of, of data into the table. So really simple, just making sure that you know our, our stage actually works in some basic way. So this is the setup phase. The execution phase is probably what Oleg is interested in, because this is where you know we started with a brand new fresh data collector instance. This execution phase of the test is where we're actually going to go ahead and start. We're actually going to create a pipeline from scratch. So no, you don't have to have a pre create a JSON template or file or anything like that that you manipulate, you basically, from Python code, will say, I want to build a pipeline from scratch. Do it for me. Do it correctly, regardless of what version of data collector I'm running. And so how this basically works is we use a pattern that we're sort of, we, it's sort of a builder pattern. It's not kind of a classical builder pattern, if, if you guys are familiar with Java. But basically, on one of these SDC builder, in this case, instances, we use a method called get pipeline builder. And that pipeline builder object basically has all the definitions of the stages for that particular data collector that you care about, all those definitions that SDC itself uses when you drag and drop things on the UI, we have that exact same logic ported into this Python SDK. 
So what that means is that if you want to add a particular stage, you take your builder object and you say, hey, add stage JDBC multi-table consumer, and it'll actually return for you an object that contains everything in the definition of the JDBC multi-table consumer. And then once you have that definition, you can do things like, hey, I want to set attributes. Like I want to set the table configs to one, you know, a specific command that I know, um, or, or a specific value that I know I want to use for my test. So these two lines of code here, create the table and then create the stage and then configure the properties of that stage. Um, as I mentioned, this is one of these stage tests where we're writing just to trash. The goal is just to get a snapshot of the data. So the next line of code is just creating a, a trash stage and there's no configuration for that. It just sends everything to dev null. And then the, the next line is kind of the, the fun line where we overload the bit shift operator in Python so that you can sort of visualize the connection of a pipeline. So instead of sort of saying, instead of taking one stage and saying add output or some other kind of Java-esque thing, you can basically just take these objects and just connect them together with these double right angle brackets. And that will actually define the, you know, kind of your, your graph that connects one stage to the next. All right, so whatever, so basically this line is visualizing what you would actually see in the, in the stream sets UI. Uh, and then finally, there's a function, once you have your builder and you're, you're happy with all the stuff you've done to it, you call a build function and that returns a pipeline object. Um, all of this that you've seen so far is actually, it's already been available in this Python SDK that we've had around for a while. Um, the only part that the test framework adds is one new method called configure for environment, which I'll talk about really, really briefly on the next slide. Um, but then once we have this pipeline object, the rest, of this, the rest of this code on this page is basically adding the pipeline in this case, to the SDC executor, the one that's going to run the, the pipeline. And then we just basically take a snapshot and then stop the pipeline at the end. OK? Um, so any questions about this part so far? This, as I said, this is all in this blog post from a few months ago. This is the Python SDK. Any questions about this wall of text I've just talked to you guys through? Cool. What can you actually do with this snapshot once you take it? You... Great question. I'll show that in the next slide, <laughs> uh, or the slide after the next slide. I'll talk about, so the question was, what can you actually do with the snapshot? I'll, I'll, I'll go into that in, in two slides time. Um, I want to just really briefly, though, explain this configure for environment bolded section. So the reason that's actually something the test framework has added is because this environment thing is a construct that's only in the test framework. In, in the SDK, we have kind of stream set specific things. Environment is something that's very specific to our testing that we want to set up. And specifically, what this means is when you're writing this test, developers don't want to have to hard code in um, JDBC connection strings or usernames or passwords of your database. You want to have a way where on the command line when you're running the test, you might say STF test and then you might say database server is you know MySQL on this machine on this port with this database name. My username for that database is this, my password is this. You don't want those things hard coded into the test and configure for environment does that. So in our code we have you know we have this module called test framework environments database. And within this, this is where we actually, we ourselves maintain these classes that talk about how to handle dealing with MySQL databases or Postgres databases or Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server, a bunch more. Um, and basically it's within these classes that we maintain as part of the test framework that we could say, hey, um, whenever somebody passes in a username on the command line in a particular way, here's where you should put it on this pipeline stage whenever you encounter that pipeline stage. Okay, it's kind of, this is kind of abstract to see. If you guys see it in, in action, it'll make more sense. But this is the way where just by calling this one method configure for environment, the pipeline, which up to this point has been totally agnostic to which environment you're pointing it to, that pipeline in that one line of code will automatically have all those configurations set for you. So Oleg's team was doing it with you know, runtime parameters with these kind of environment variables. You can do that. Um, but with this SDK, specifically with the test framework, you can sort of build that into this configure for environment call. So pretty much all of our tests that talk to an external environment will have this line with the configure for environment in it. So once we have our snapshot, what can we do with it? Um, so we can assert on the data in this case. Um, so essentially, when you have a snapshot object in this SDK, anything you can do through the UI, which means you can look at any of the fields, you can look at headers, you can introspect on the underlying sort of raw data. Um, you, can audit, you can get all of that through this Python SDK as well. So in this case, we're doing something really simple, which is we have our snapshot, and we basically just want to look at the values that are pulled out of it. So we had inserted certain rows into columns in, in this table of, of our database. So in this case, all we're doing is we're taking the snapshot object that we had, and we're basically saying, okay, well, just look at the output of the 
um, in this case, the, the first stage of the pipeline, which is the origin, look at the output of that one and just tell me what the values are. And let's just go ahead and as part of the test, assert that the rows from the snapshot match the rows we put in in the first place. So this is just kind of an end-to-end -end test now saying the things I thought I loaded in in step one, make sure that I'm actually seeing that in my snapshot in step three. I hope that makes sense. Um, last part, really simple, tear down. We drop the table, um, which you know removes the rows that we've added into our database. One, one minor point that I kind of glossed over is that we make sure that as soon as we start talking to environments, we do everything in try finally blocks so that if at any point in the test something goes wrong, we don't want to just leave around dangling data in databases. We want to make sure to clean up after ourselves. So we always make sure to follow this kind of, th this pattern of where, um, you know, when we're actually setting up, we run things and try. And then if anything goes wrong, we make sure that the finally has the dropping of the database at the end. So any questions about what I showed in the test walkthrough? It's kind of a lot. I'm aware of this. Is it possible to reverse engineer existing pipelines into code? Yes. Yes. So what, one of the one of the um, methods that's available in this pipeline builder is you can say pipe, once you have your pipeline builder object, you can say import pipeline, which you can pass it in a JSON, and it'll automatically then create this object model with all the different stages. So you could then, starting with one of those, and we've had a customer that does this, they had one particular state, one particular pipeline that was really, really complex that they built in the UI, and then they said, this is what I want, but I want to build 5,000 of these pipelines with just one configuration different in one of these stages, and so they can run a Python loop, and six lines of code later, they have 5,000 pipelines generated. So what's next? So I, I just threw a lot of uh, talk at you guys, but we have a lot more talking to do, or I do. Um, so we have a lot more information that's going to be made publicly available about how we do testing at stream sets. Um, so just a, a, a sneak preview of it. Um, one is test environments. I just sort of took for granted that we have databases that we could start up. Uh, Pat mentioned specifically that we have the ability to start up CDH clusters and uh, Hortonworks clusters and MapR clusters and all kinds of databases and all kinds of other fun stuff. We have tooling that we've written to do this really, really quickly in Docker on single machines. And we will actually release that publicly um, in the not too distant future as something called STE, which is Streams as Test Environments. So stay tuned for that. Um, other things we are going to do is we're going to actually talk about the automated Jenkins execution that we run on a nightly basis at the company. So if you guys are sort of curious about, should I give my money to stream sets? How do I know they actually test any of the stuff they claim to support? Well, we test it. You see there's cells that are yellow, so we know there are bugs in our code. Um, but knowing is a good thing. So we will talk about that in one of our future blog posts. And then lastly, um, we run so many tests actually on a nightly basis that Jenkins alone was not sufficient for us to actually be able to track test failures and trends and figuring out if certain environments were buggy over others. So we actually wrote an entire web front end called Stream Sets Bifocals, which lets us introspect on our test result history and figure out things like, for example, this happened two days ago. Uh, which commit caused our stage that talks to, oh God, what was it? Which, which commit was it that broke our ability to talk to Confluence Kafka schema registry? Which exact commit of data collector caused that? I know because Bifocals told me this is the commit that broke it because all the tests were green and then this one commit went in and now all the tests are red. So that's one of the things that Bifocals has done for us. We're gonna blog a little bit about why we built Bifocals and how it works. All right, I've been racing, how am I on time? Oh, not so bad. Okay, cool. I talked really fast. Thank you.